Dark Cast Network, Indie Pods with a Dark Side. excited about the case that I'm going to be talking about this week, next week, and there's probably going to be a part three. So TikTok is a fantastic place. If you haven't followed me on TikTok yet, F that pod, I was scrolling across TikTok the other day and I came across somebody on TikTok by the name of Chad Hauer. I'm going to link his socials in the show notes, but he's known as the TikTok fugitive. I started to watch his videos. And I was immediately compelled. So I reached out to him and asked him if he would be okay with me covering his case with him. And so that's what I'm going to be covering, the TikTok fugitive. The biggest component of his case is the several-year-long custody battle that he had with his ex-wife. And so part one, I'm just going to be covering the entirety of that. And then in parts two and three, I'm going to be talking about how he ended up where he is today. Chad Hauer was born in Erie, Pennsylvania, and it is in Pennsylvania where he met his first wife, Nancy Oberlander, and he met Nancy through hanging out in a mutual friend bubble. Chad at the time was working at Taco Bell, and Nancy was working at Dunkin' Donuts. Honestly, the free food exchange between these two is relationship goals. Chad ended up marrying his first wife, Nancy, on October 15th in 1994. Chad and Nancy were very young at the time. When they were wed, they were around 19 to 20. They ended up getting married in Kentucky. And this is because Pennsylvania had a wait period at the time, and they also had strict requirements for a marriage certificate. So Chad and Nancy got married on a whim in Kentucky in a shopping mall. Nancy loved horses. You guys already know what I have to say about women that love horses, and I'm just going to leave it at that. So Nancy loved horses, so they often made trips to Kentucky for the Kentucky Horse Show. So they already had a connection to Kentucky. So yeah, we met and got married at 18 or 19. Shouldn't have got married. Long story, we just got married too young. Even though Chad and Nancy got married too young, they moved into our parents' home. And around this time, Chad decided to pursue his dreams of becoming a software engineer. From even, I remember back when they first put me in front of a computer in first grade when I was six. And from that point on, all throughout school, whether it's high school, middle school, they always asked to be like, I remember second grade, they asked all the kids, what does everybody want to do? And everybody's like, I want to be a firefighter, president, astronaut, like computer programmer. This was 1982, back when computer programming was not really a thing. It's obvious that Chad has always had a passion for computer programming, even before it was really an actual thing. So Chad decided that he was going to begin pursuing contract roles. Chad and Nancy left Pennsylvania in 1994 when he began working contract roles. During this time, Chad and Nancy lived in Texas during one of his short-term contracts. Then they relocated to Michigan when Chad was hired at Kelly Temporary Services at their headquarters. In 1995, Chad got a lucrative job offer in Tennessee at Eastman, so they relocated for one final time. Eastman is a big fucking deal. Eastman was one of the largest chemical companies in the world at the time. And I'm not sure if any of you have ever heard of this company. It's not really a huge name, but Kodak, you know, like the cameras. Well, Eastman was a subsidiary of Kodak. I'm harping on Chad's career a bit because one thing that I immediately noticed during our conversation was his intelligence. He's probably one of the most intelligent people that I've ever had a conversation with. And that's not something I say lightly. But what's important about this is his intelligence and vast knowledge in his field propelled him in his, into his insane career, which I'll get into later, but that also plays a big role into his story. So Chad was hired by Eastman in 1995, and they paid for him to relocate with his wife, Nancy. In 1996, Nancy and Chad had their son, Eris, who prefers to be called Alex, so I will be calling him Alex from here on out. So again, I'm reiterating this because it's really important to the story. They relocated to Tennessee when Chad was hired by Eastman. So they're living in Tennessee. Alex is born in Tennessee. 
and this is the only state where Nancy, Chad, and Alex will live. And again, this is a very critical detail moving forward, so hang on to it. After working at Eastman for several years, Chad realized he was not being challenged enough at work, so he began to look for other opportunities and began, again, working as a contractor. His first contract job after being hired full-time by Eastman was in Connecticut, so he would typically travel for work in Connecticut for around a week, and then he'd return home for around a week, which is pretty, pretty standard. Chad continued this type of work across multiple states until early 2001, when he eventually ended up getting a role that caused him to leave the United States. And at this point, Chad decided to, and this was really the precipice of their relationship, Chad decided to break things off with Nancy during this time, and so they officially separated. According to Chad, like you heard in that audio blip earlier, they got married far too young, and the dynamic of their relationship in its entirety was more like a friendship instead of a marriage. Chad, in our conversation, didn't have anything negative to say about his marriage with Nancy. He said that he and Nancy didn't really get into any disagreements. There was nothing particularly hurtful done on either side. It was just two friends that got married, got married way too young, and should have remained friends. Since they had a son, Chad decided to leave Nancy with the house and one of the vehicles, which was a newer vehicle at that point. He paid child support, and he paid $3,000 a month in alimony, which I did the math. Today, that's $5,171.38 today. That is so much fucking money. I mean, I personally, I could do so much damage with that, but... That's neither here nor there. In 2002, when Alex was between five and six, Chad and Nancy worked on a parenting plan together. And if Chad was going to be in the country, because he was living outside the United States at this time, and he wanted to see Alex, he and Nancy agreed that that would be okay, provided he gave her a certain amount of time's notice. I think it was like, during our conversation, he said like 48 to 72 hours notice. But either way, he would contact Nancy They'd either agree or disagree, and then he'd be able to see him if it didn't interfere with his schooling. According to Chad, and according to documentation that he provided me, which I'll include in the show notes, immediately Nancy began to interfere with the parenting plan that they had both agreed to. In Tennessee, this whole process with divorce, it goes through arbitration. But when Chad and Nancy, with their respective lawyers, met with the arbitrator, the arbitrator decided that it was best to just send it immediately to court because between the divorce and the custody agreement with Alex, it was evident that Nancy was not going to play fair. At this point in time, Chad is working in Europe. They're separated, but he's still going through a very tumultuous divorce process with Nance. And he ends up meeting his second wife, who, by the way, he's still married to. They've been together for over 20 years. They have children together. Once the divorce was finalized, he ended up remarrying his second wife, but he still continued to have problems with Nancy. According to Chad and according to several court documents that I was provided with, any time that he would call, nobody would answer, or if he did get Alex on the phone, it would be very brief and good old Nance would terminate the call immediately. Additionally, when Chad would call, and say, hey, I'm going to be in the United States at this time, and he would be asking for a visit, Nance would agree, but when Chad would eventually show up, again, he's in Europe. It's, it's not easy. I don't know how many of you have been from, like, Europe to America. It is, like, a whole fucking process. It's, like, a fucking 7, 9, 10, 12-hour flight. It's not easy. So he'd make his way to the United States, and nobody would be home. This would continue into 2004. So this is now two full years that Chad wasn't able to speak to his son regularly or see his son on a consistent basis. So by mid-2004, Chad is now reaching out again to Alex, and at this point, he's able to get him on the phone. The only reason he's able to do so is because Nance is outside. Maybe she's gardening. I don't know. Maybe she's sitting out there basking in the sunlight like a snake ready to shut her skin. I don't know. She's outside. So he's able to get his son on the phone briefly. And during this conversation, Alex is like, hey, dad, keep in mind, he's super young. This is 2004. Alex is barely eight at this point. And he's like, hey, dad, we're moving too. And at that point, Nance comes inside. She begins to yell and she proceeds to hang up the phone. But Chad is able to make out that it sounds like Alex is saying something along the lines of, hey, we're moving to Cherry. 
And Chad's like, I don't know what the fuck Cherry is or where it's at. But this sent Chad into a panic like it would any mother or father because of the custody agreement that they agreed to. Now, at this point, again, they all lived in Tennessee. So any agreement that they had was done in Tennessee courts. So if anybody's familiar with the custodial process, if you are going to relocate a child, you have to file it in the court where you're currently located and then have that transferred to the other court. But all parties involved have to comply. You know, even if the mother has sole custody and the dad has visitation, like maybe on the weekends, both parents have to comply. This isn't just, you can't just take your kid and run, even if the parent only has one day a week. So this is very problematic. So Nancy is required to inform the court prior to moving so that these parental rights could be transferred to wherever she's moving to. But of course, good old Nance did not do that because she is a problematic person. At this point in time, Chad is working between Russia and Cyprus in software engineering. So most of his communication with Nance was done through email. He did tell me that a few months prior to the phone call that he had with Alex, that she did have an email where she hinted that maybe she wanted to move back to the Pennsylvania area. Again, this is where they're from. And she harped on the fact that, you know, this is where her family is. And he had no issue with that. He was like, I understand that. I'm totally fine with that. We need to discuss it, but I'm open to that discussion. So he didn't shoot it down. He said he's open to the discussion, but she took that and she ran with it. And she's like, well, I'm just going to fucking move. Now, after this phone call where Alex says something about moving to Cherry, Nancy just stops answering the phone completely. She stops replying to any emails to Chad, and she completely falls off the face of the earth, with the exception of disparaging letters that she begins to send to Chad's mother, which I was provided with. I read these. These actually exist. Various other relatives, but not to Chad directly. Now, Chad's mother, who has MS, is blind and has a multitude of health issues, is now forced to become the intermediary between the two, faxing letters between Nance and Chad. While this is going on, Nance has refused to provide an address. Regardless of the situation, she's like, fuck you, I'm not going to tell you where I'm at. And What ended up happening is these letters from Nancy were postmarked from Pittsburgh, which obviously indicated that she had already moved because Pittsburgh's in Pennsylvania. They were living in Knoxville County, Tennessee. So this proved the fact that she had already decided to make that move without court authorization. So at this point, Chad is in full panic mode. He began to search for areas where Nancy could have moved with Alex. He initially filed in Knox County, Tennessee, which is where everything happened prior and which is what he should have done to inform them that she was planning to move without notifying the court. Nancy was issued an injunction by the court, which then set a court date requiring her to notify the court of her intention to move. Nancy was served in Tennessee and was given a court date within the month, but she didn't fucking appear. And by the way, I just want to say, I know that custody can get hairy, I think one of the biggest problems with custody is that, at least from my experience, from my parents, courts will tend to side on one parent, like regardless of the facts. And I just feel like this has always been problematic. Every case I read about this, courts will pick a side and they will completely ignore any red flag or any documentation that solidifies that one parent might be the better parent. And it's just I don't know. I don't know how he fixed this, but this is a big fucking deal. And it's blaringly obvious in this case. So it's now September of 2004. Chad is feeling helpless and he is left with, okay, I'm going to just call all of these school districts. At this point, Nancy has messed with him through letters. She's like, oh, maybe I'll move to New York. Maybe I'll move to Ohio. Maybe I'll move to Pennsylvania. 
And he's just like, okay, cool. This is a million different places I need to call. So this man looking for his son now begins to call school districts. The amount of school districts across all of those states, I just, I can't even begin to tell you. But he does it, trying to locate his son. And after making dozens of calls, Chad calls a school district in Venango County, Pennsylvania. The person that he spoke to on the phone asked Chad to fax over the documents to confirm that he was, in fact, Alex's father, and he indeed had visitation rights. So he did, because he had this documentation, ready and willing to go. The following day, the district confirmed that his son was enrolled in school in Cherry Tree Township. So remember, he heard his son say something about Cherry and hang up the phone. So Cherry Tree Township is a real place. Chad and his wife quickly flew to the United States, staying with his mother, who again still lived in Pennsylvania. Chad reached out to a lawyer and went to the elementary school where his son was enrolled. Remember, he's really young at this point, like eight, maybe turning nine. But the school wouldn't allow Chad to see his son and told him that they needed to get a court order. So Chad did. But Nance objected to this which then meant that Chad had to contact the Venango County Sheriff's Office so that he could be escorted at the school to see his son. When Chad recalled the moment that his son was brought into the conference room to see his kid, Chad said that Alex was shaking. He was terrified, saying, you know, my dad's going to kidnap me. But Chad then ended up learning that the elementary school was informed that Chad would kidnap Alex by Nance, which is why they were requiring him to get a court order to see Alex. And it's obviously why Alex was so hesitant to see his father at that point in time. Chad said that understandably, Alex wouldn't say much to him at that point in time, but he did manage to see his school file, which had his address, which is what he needed so that Nancy could now be served. Because remember, at this point, everything that has to do with their custody battle is supposed to be in Knoxville County, Tennessee. But now she has taken the son across state lines to Pennsylvania, which doesn't have jurisdiction over this custody matter, without notifying the courts, without notifying his father. And now she's been living there illegally with him. So he now has the address and he can now serve her. One would think that at this point, Nance would be feeling defeated. She would at this point realize that her resistance is futile and that she should fucking comply. But no, remember, Nance is a horse girl and horse girls do not abide by the laws of humanity. Horse girls do as they please. So when Nance is served with a document requiring her to appear before a Tennessee judge, which is where this custody agreement's jurisdiction is, regarding her move, She blatantly refused because she lives in Pennsylvania now, illegally with her son, not Tennessee. Nancy is then served with an order from a Pennsylvania judge requiring her to appear before said Tennessee judge regarding her move, to which she also refused. The balls, the balls on this woman, I, unfathomable unfathomable. I'm not really sure if refusing to comply with a judge's ballsy, stupid, or both, but regardless, it's obviously going to have consequences. So the judge in Pennsylvania said, okay, Nance, I am granting temporary custody to Chad because Nance is obviously not firing on all cylinders here. She's either desperate or crazy. I don't know, but she's not firing on all cylinders. So the Pennsylvania judge is like, all right, no, this isn't going to work out. But Nance refused to comply again because at this point, just why not keep going? So then the judge ordered Alex's removal through the Venango County Sheriff's Department and Chad is granted temporary custody of Alex. So now based on all of this, we are now in December 2004. Chad's granted temporary custody of Alex. So Chad and his wife rent a place in Tennessee 
they all move in here. So this to me just shows Chad's willingness to go above and beyond for his child. He was working in another country without hesitation. And, and, and the stepmother as well, they drop everything. They relocate to take care of Alex. So to me, I think this is a testament to how dedicated they were to being in Alex's life and taking care of him. So Alex was re-enrolled in school in Tennessee, and a Tennessee judge sent Nancy another court hearing date for March of 2005 over all of this fucking bullshit. Chad started Alex in therapy. He had noticed that he seemed to have some challenges, and so he just wanted to do everything he could to ensure that his son could cope with everything that he had been through in his life. Nancy actually shows up to this scheduled hearing, but during this hearing, the judge grants custody back to Nancy. But his requirements of this is that Alex needs to spend summers every summer overseas with Chad. Additionally, Chad would get to pick specific times during the year that didn't interfere with school, where he would get to spend time with him overseas. During this hearing, the judge scolded Nancy for refusing to appear in court several times and let her know that should she slip up again, he will grant custody of Alex to Chad. So again, this is in March. Now this means that come summer, Alex needs to spend the summer overseas with his dad. But as summer approaches, when Nance is required to send Alex overseas to spend time with Chad, what do you guys think she's going to do? Do you think she's going to send him there? If you said no, then you are fucking correct because she refused to get Alex a passport. On June 10, 2005, Chad's parents arrived at Nancy's home in order to pick up Alex to bring him to the airport for his flight to Cyprus for Chad's scheduled co-parenting time. When Chad's parents arrived at Nancy's home, the door was locked, the lights were off, and there were no cars visible. Chad's parents tried to knock on the door. They tried to call the home several times to no avail. Leading up to this, any attempts that were made to try to get in contact with Nancy the prior week were ignored. Now, following this event, Nancy was told by a judge that if she did not comply and put Alex on a plane for his scheduled visitation with his father, that the custody would be transferred to Chad. But Nance continued to not comply. Alex is not put on a plane, and Nance and Alex are nowhere to be found. Chad filed with courts in Tennessee, and the court date was scheduled, but Nance did not show up. Shocking. Chad then proceeds to file in Pennsylvania court, but he is told that they do not have jurisdiction. I'm going to say this one more time because it's super important for, like, the end of this episode, part two and part three. Chad proceeds to file in Pennsylvania court, but he, he is told that they do not have jurisdiction. Really fucking important because Alex lived in Tennessee and wasn't moved to Pennsylvania properly and didn't live there long enough. It was like a month at this point. Instead of penalizing Nancy, seeing as she has now missed multiple hearings, the Pennsylvania judge takes pity on her and asks the Tennessee judge to allow her to have another hearing. Obviously, at this point, the Tennessee judge is fucking pissed. Nance has shafted him multiple times. Clearly, she doesn't give a shit. She does not abide by regular person laws. She abides by horsewoman laws, which are, like, fucking crazy. So she doesn't give a fuck. But the Tennessee judge agrees to have another hearing. Now we're in October of 2005. This has been going on for fucking years. And at this point, Chad is now a full-time employee at Microsoft. This is what I wanted to harp on earlier. So when I had mentioned his intelligence, it was for a reason. Chad had an incredibly successful career at Microsoft, where he was the regional developer advisor for Microsoft Middle East and Africa. This is information that you can verify on Microsoft.com on your own. I included the links in the show notes. He won the Microsoft Most Valuable Professional Award in 2007 for the first time, ultimately receiving that award 10 times from Microsoft. In that role, he was responsible for 85 countries that spanned across four continents and 10 time zones. I mean, this is like, this is fucking incredible. He's lived in Canada, Cyprus, Switzerland, France, Bulgaria, Jordan, Russia, Turkey, the Caribbean, and Tennessee. I mean, this guy, it's awesome. 
but he now has to take time off of work from his job and fly back to the United States again, hoping that this time it's not for naught and that it's not another wasted trip where Nance just decides she's not going to fucking show up and waste everybody's time. This time, the judge required Nance to attend the Tennessee hearing. If she couldn't, then the judge wanted her to bring Alex. Surprisingly, she attended and she brought Alex. I don't know if Nance was expecting a different outcome, but she has been in noncompliance for years at a time, so obviously it didn't go her way this time. Chad was given custody of Alex temporarily. They ended up flying back to Turkey because Chad was living between Turkey and Cyprus at the time, and Alex was enrolled into private school. And now Nance is fucking pissed. She immediately starts filing petitions, complaining about whatever she can. I don't, she has no complaints, but she's just making shit up. She's just grasping at straws. But Chad is doing whatever he can to keep her involved in her son's life. Now, at this point, Nancy is scheduled to see Alex during summers. So in June of 2006, when Chad had to fly to the United States from Microsoft, he flew with his son from Turkey to Boston so Alex could have his summer visitation with his mother. This would be the last time that Chad was ever in the United States. That's another important detail for this case. From Boston, Chad arranged for Alex to have an escorted flight because he was still a kid to Cleveland. Alex was turning 10 at this time. So he was picked up by his grandparents and then driven to Titusville, Pennsylvania, which is where good old horse girl Nance was living at the time. For the entirety of this summer, whenever Chad tried to get a hold of Alex, he could not get in touch with him. By August, Chad was informed, by the way, August, last minute, when he's supposed to fly back to go back to school in Turkey, Chad was informed by his attorney that a petition was filed in Venango County against him with a laundry list of grievances against him that were all untrue. Ultimately, Nance argued that Europe is unsafe and she refused to return Alex back at the end of the summer. What's problematic about this is that Tennessee, again, for the 150th time, was deemed as a location that would have jurisdiction over matters regarding Alex until he turned 18. This was mutually agreed upon between Chad and Nancy. Since Alex especially would be living internationally, Chad did this to make this easier for everybody involved. The Pennsylvania judge reminded Nance for the 1,000th time that, again, Tennessee holds jurisdiction over this and that she must comply with what they ordered and that she must send Alex back with his father. Nance refused to comply, so it escalated to the point that Alex was again removed by deputies of Venango County, and returned to his father, who at this point was in Cyprus. And Alex was again enrolled into a private school in Cyprus. The theme is that good old Nance has a really hard time letting things go. So she files another petition in Pennsylvania courts. This time she states that Alex was born in Crawford County, Pennsylvania, which is not Venango County, where she has been filing all of these grievances, but even more importantly, this is not where Alex was born. He was born in Tennessee. Remember, Knoxville County is where everything has been happening up until this point. In an effort to push her agenda further, Nance also states that her parents live in Venango County, which is also not true. But regardless of this, the Venango County judge decides that he is going to take jurisdiction. You know what, before I, before I continue the sentence, this is the same judge that has been involved this entire time, right? So you would think that this dude would be well aware of what's going on, right? He's been dealing with this. But no, he decides that he's going to take jurisdiction without verifying Alex's birth, without verifying anything and without contacting the judge in Tennessee that he's been in contact with, where they actually have jurisdiction. 
and requires that Chad and Alex have to appear in court in Pennsylvania. Alex is enrolled in school in another country, and Chad, who is a very important person for Microsoft, neither of which can leave on short notice, so Chad sends his lawyers with documentation to combat this bullshit. But because Chad doesn't show and doesn't send Alex, this Pennsylvania judge that's already familiar with this case, and this is what is absolutely baffling to me, he takes emergency jurisdiction on November 6th. So just to recap, Alex is sent in June of 2006. Chad doesn't hear from him. Nance pulls her bullshit the end of August. Now we're in November of 2006. And as another reminder, the bullshit grievances that Nance filed in August of 2006, remember that Alex was escorted out of Nance's house, flown back to where his dad was, So we have August, September, October, November. We're now in November. And these grievances that are so dire because Alex is so unsafe in Cyprus with his father, now we are filing for an emergency order based on those grievances. What is wild to me is this is the judge that had Alex removed by deputies from Nance's home and flown back to Cyprus to his father, Chad, but now he is claiming emergency jurisdiction over these complaints three months later. It doesn't make any sense to me. I need somebody to make it make sense. The judge ended up ordering an interlocutory order granting Nance custody until Chad could appear in court with another hearing set for December. Chad immediately notified them and said, I cannot attend due to work, but I'm going to send legal representation. And constant communication the whole time with nothing to hide. In the meantime, Chad's lawyers are trying to appeal, but they can't due to the specific order that the judge filed. As 2006 comes to a close, we're approaching 2007, Alex, his son, is still in Cyprus completely willingly, completely on his dad's side. But all the while, Chad is still trying to fight against this interlocutory order. But as December of 2006 approaches into January 2007, really, as of December 2006, Alex can no longer reach his mother over the phone. So Chad did his best, and he communicated this to me, and it's shown in documentation that he really did his best throughout this entire process, in spite of all this bullshit with Nance, that he wanted to make sure that Alex could stay in contact. Nancy never responds. Maybe she's frolicking on horses through buttercup fields. I don't know. And eventually, that the mail that Chad was sending out, the mail that Alex was sending out, it all gets returned. So as summer of 2007 approaches, which is when Nance is supposed to again get Alex for the summer, Chad is really at an impasse. Nance has been MIA for months. The previous summer, she literally refused to return Alex back to Chad. This is a big red flag. It's a big problem. And the cherry on top of this disaster is the fact that there are two conflicting court orders at this point, right? We have Knoxville County, Tennessee, which has jurisdiction over Alex until he turns 18. But now we have this order-happy judge in Pennsylvania who apparently doesn't like to verify birth certificates or anything else before making a ruling that issued this interlocutory order. I cannot for the life of me fathom why any parent would choose to put their child on a plane across the globe given the circumstances. Personally, if I was Chad, I wouldn't. And he decided not to either. And what I think speaks volumes about this circumstance is this right here. So he doesn't send Alex for the summer of 2007 and nothing happens, right? So in my mind, if I'm a mother, and I don't get my son for the summer, I'm going to fucking flip shit if there's really something to be concerned about. But nothing really happens in 2007. 
which says to me that she has nothing to be concerned of, right? So nothing happens really for the remainder of 2007. If the courts really thought that Alex was truly in danger, which is what that bullshit order was based upon last year, they would not let this happen. They would not let Alex continue to remain with his father until January of 2008, which is when this picks up again. So in January of 2008, Chad's mother gets a phone call from the Pennsylvania State Police. Remember that Nancy and Chad were initially, prior to Alex's birth, from Pennsylvania. So Chad's mother lives in Crawford County, Pennsylvania. So the Pennsylvania State Police call her and they inform her that they need to speak to Chad over a kidnapping report that they received from none other than Nance. What's interesting is that Nance gave the state police Chad's mother's number, even though she had Chad's contact information. Chad called the contact that his mother was given for the barracks in Venango County and sent over the court orders to the officer that he spoke with. He was like, listen, this isn't true. I can provide you with whatever you need. He was, he had cause for concern. He said, listen, officer, like, is there any way that I can combat this with like a false kidnapping report? And the officer was like, ah, oh, you know, she just sounds like a distraught mother. I haven't really filed any documentation yet. So like, we're just gonna, we're just gonna let it go. Uh, which is, I'm a woman and coming from a woman, I understand that the courts always side with the moms and listen. I'm a woman, so okay, cool. But that's not always how it needs to be. It's very evident in this case that he is hitting every roadblock possible because he's a father. And I can't help but think that if he was the mother, that it would be very difficult. I mean, it's obvious because Nancy, who is clearly the villain in this story, has been given chance after chance after chance. And now she's filing false kidnapping charges. And she's just getting a hall pass for being a distraught person. I, this is absolutely asinine to me. So he asks to have these charges filed against Nancy, but the officer ensures Chad that, you know, I haven't filed anything against you. Nancy's just a distraught mother. Let's let it go. So after this, Chad feels relatively confident that if anything were to happen, because again, he didn't send Alex in the summer of 2007, she'd have to go to Tennessee for that. And uh, she hasn't fucking gone before. So why would he think that she would? While logistically Chad's assumptions were correct, I've taken you on a roller coaster ride during this episode where logistics don't matter, jurisdiction doesn't matter, and anything can happen. Because remember, we aren't abiding by normal people laws, we're abiding by horse girl laws. So, in the early spring of 2008, two FBI agents show up at Chad's blind mother's house. And unfortunately for Chad, his multi-year nightmare is just beginning. Chad's life was about to unravel. His career with Microsoft would be completely compromised. Almost all of his relationships would be destroyed and he'd become a very wanted man. And what I mean by this is he would be not only wanted by the FBI still to this day, but he would have an Interpol red notice issued against him as well. Stay tuned for part two to hear the rest of his story. If you liked what you heard today, please like, review, and subscribe wherever you listen to your podcast. Please, it helps with the visibility. Find me on every social media at fthatpod, except for Instagram, which is at fthat underscore pod. Love you so much.